that we as a church don't miss the beauty of what just happened. That as students prayed for adults, adults prayed for students, and uh, such a beautiful moment. And I know there are those of you who were sitting in different places, and you said, well, I couldn't hear what they were praying for. Hopefully you were praying uh, for the students as, as we were led in prayer. But, uh, and, and wow, what a beautiful thing our students did. Um, I, I know that there are many adults that would be terrified to do what these teenagers just stood and did pray aloud in front of a room full of people that a lot of them they don't know so thank you students for being willing to do that thank you adults who were who were willing to lead in that moment it is our calling it's our duty it's our job our responsibility to pray for one another well we're gonna as i said continue uh, in the book of ephesians because over the last couple of days we've been in the book of Ephesians so you're coming into session four of what we've been walking through in Ephesians chapter two so go ahead and find your way there to Ephesians chapter two as you're doing that uh, I want to explain to you why there's this beautiful piece of art in uh, in in the front of the the church here this is uh, this is like a postmodern piece of art you kind of create your own meaning for this thing right here uh, it, I tell you where this came from this came from our, um, our students, they walked in on Friday night. We, we gave them one of, one of these, something that looks like this, a giant Lego block. And then we just gave them five minutes. And we said, in five minutes, everybody bring your block up and build something. And this is what they came up with. So uh, there was really no plan to it. They just kind of came in, had to find a place for their block to fit. And so we've been using that all weekend. We've been talking about how uh, Legos relate to our life, so I want to bring you into that discussion today. Now, uh, I know that uh, you think Legos, ah, those, are, those are for kids, but let's just be honest. Uh, we never really outgrow playing with Legos. Let's just be honest w- about that. It's always fun. We love to play th- with them. We love to build things with them. They're a lot of fun, and there are a lot of reasons why I want us thinking about Legos. Uh, I want us thinking about Legos because of what Scripture teaches us in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul talks about... Uh, several metaphors and he uses metaphors for who we are as a church who we are as God's people so he begins with this metaphor of a body he says we're we're a body and this is a metaphor that Paul's used in other places he says we're we're a body and we're a body that was divided but we were we had one part of our body that was separated alienated with strangers from the other part of the body and God sent Jesus to tear down the dividing wall of hostility that we mentioned earlier it just tore that wall down and then brought that body together into as he describes it one new man so now it's one new man and that's that's where all those little categories that the world wants to put us into rich poor black white uh, uh, red or blue state that that the Bible says he came and just destroyed all of that and and all those things that would separate us and brought us together so that when we're in Christ we're united in one body and then he shifts gears and he starts talking about a household a family and he talks about how we're a part of the family of God he says we're God's household In other words, we've got a seat at God's table. We're all sitting around God's table. He's our father, and we're seated at that table, and uh, we have a place there in his family and in his household. And then in the middle of that conversation, he shifts gears to talk about the third metaphor, the third metaphor for us as a church. And that's the one I want to speak to you about today. And he starts talking about how we're, we're God's building. Specifically, as we'll see in the text, he says we're, we're like God's temple. God is building us. In other words, he's using each one of us as a part in this temple that he is building, this thing he's putting together called the church, and he is using us. And we all have our part. And we all find our fit as followers of Christ in his plan to do this. So that leads me to my message for today. The message is this. In Christ, the people of God gathered in the church of God are the temple of God to the glory of God. In Christ, the people of God, that's us, gathered in the church of God, that's what we're doing here, are the temple of God for the glory 
of God. Look with me, if you will, there in Ephesians chapter 2. We're just going to read verse 22. So we're going to focus our minds and attentions on this summary verse. The Bible says this, In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. In Christ, the people of God gathered in the church of God are the temple of God to the glory of God. Let's look at that statement by statement first. In Christ, we are the people of God. He says, in him, that's Jesus, in him, you also, you also. Now, we have a, a bad habit of reading our Bibles, and, and I want to continually remind us of this, that when we read the word you, we think me, me, I, in Christ, uh, I also, I have a part. But we shouldn't think me, we should think we, because God's not speaking individualistically, he's speaking corporately. And most of the time in the New Testament, when we see that word you, it's most often a corporate you. It's the good old Southern word y'all. It's in Christ y'all. God's doing something in y'all in this room. In other words, we are the people of God. We are together as the people of God. That's why it's so important that you have a place in the, the family of God. It's so important that you can't say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't really need church. So you can't really say that. Some people say that, and, and I warned in the first service, I warned our students that they're going to start hearing that, especially as they grow up. Some of them will move off to college. Some of them will relocate when they, they get married or they get a job, and, and you guys are going to get disconnected from this local faith family just by geography, or you're going to grow up and you're going to have to make your own decisions. Some of you have been made to come to church every Sunday of your life, every Wednesday of your life, every Sunday night, you know, Bible school. I mean, somebody has said, you're going to church today, and that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing you should thank God for. But there's coming a time where you're going to have to make your own decision. And this thought's going to go through your mind. You know, I don't think I need church to be a Christian. I can follow Jesus and believe in Jesus without uh, being a part of a church. Uh, how many of you adults say, hey, I've heard somebody say that before. How many of you raise your hand? How many of you have heard somebody say that? That's a thought that's out there. I had somebody come up to me after the first service and say, Pastor, if you had asked, has anyone ever thought that and lived that way, I would have raised my hand. Because I can tell you, I've lived that way. I have disconnected myself from the family, and I have paid the consequences. You're designed to live in family together. Why? Because in Christ, we are the people of God. This is a corporate thing that he is doing together. And, and the other thing I like about Legos is their design. They are designed to connect to something. So they're not quite right by themselves. They don't work unless they are connected to something. And you look at a Lego and you go, this thing is made to connect to something else. That's the way that God has designed us. Doesn't matter whether we're uh, a big Lego, a small Lego. It doesn't matter what color we are, what shape we are. Uh, there are some uses for one that's this size. There are some uses for one that are this size. There are Legos. There are things that this Lego can do that this one can't. And there are things that this one can do that this one can't. And God brings them all together. And he says, you have a place to connect. I've got a plan. I'm working out with what I'm building. I am building something and you are part of it. In Christ, we are the people of God. That's why it's so important. It's so important that we not function in this way. That we not function as many churches across North America do. Where we've got people who are choosing to sit on this side of the room because they know someone else sits on the other side of the room. And they choose to walk in, or they might choose to walk in this door and sit on this side, or they might choose to come to the second service because they know someone else comes to the first service because things aren't right between them and someone else. No, this is something we do together. We are the people of God, and there is no place for that amongst the people of God. You say, well, pastor, it was really the person who offended me. It's their job to come to me. Not according to Jesus. Matthew 18 says that if your brother sins against you, Go to him. Go to him. Go to him and, and maybe you'll win back your brother. So go to him. Say, well, pastor, I, I hear what you're saying. It'd be different if somebody had sinned against me. But in this case, somebody's upset with me. I didn't do anything wrong. Well, so I'm not responsible to go to him. Not according to Jesus. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says that if you are offering your sacrifice at the altar, you are in the middle of worship. It might be for us. I mean, you are singing Waymaker from the bottom of your heart. And I mean, you are singing it out and it hits you. 
My brother's upset with me. You know what Jesus said? Stop what you are doing. Put the, all, the sacrifice down. Go and be made right with your brother. Then come back and continue your worship. See, Jesus, when you put Matthew 18 and Matthew 5 together, what Jesus tells us is the responsibility is not on the person who sinned or on the person who was sinned against. The responsibility is on the person who knows about the offense. The one, the first one that it comes to their mind, it comes to their recognition. They realize it, they recognize it, and they're willing to be obedient to the commands of Jesus. We cannot afford as a family of God, as a church of The Lord, we can't afford to let little things or even big things come between us. Why? Because in Christ, we are the people of God and we cannot function uh, as the people of God like the world out there functions. This is not a place of division. This is a place of unity. In Christ, we are the people of God. Secondly, in Christ, we are gathered in the church of God. In other words, we come together as the people of God, but we're more than just a group of people. We are a church. God is building something here. This is not just some kind of haphazard thing that just so happens that we gather in the same room. No, God's got a plan. In fact, if you work with Legos very often, then you know what one of these is. This is an instruction booklet. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but especially when your kids are younger, they get a box of Legos and and it's a really complicated set to put together. And the uh, Legos, uh, they, they put this plan together. They do a great job. They even put the bags and they put the numbers on the bags. You've seen these bags where it's like one, you open this bag first. You build everything in there. Then number two, you open that bag. Number three and four and five, it's got the parts separated. Anybody ever had this happen where you come in and your kids got everything open? They've opened all the bags, dumped them out in a big pile. And you're like, good times. <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> Why? Because Lego has an instruction booklet. They've got the plan. There are some engineers that have spent countless hours putting this plan together, and they have made sure that inside of those bags are everything that you need. And what's your job? Your job is to open it up. And so if I were to turn over here to page five, I see that in page five, uh, all the pieces that I need, what I'm supposed to do first, what I'm supposed to do second. They even have these little symbols in here that tell me when I need to turn it over so that I can add a peak. Now, some of y'all grew up with kids in the 80s, and you're like, where was this back then? (laughs) But there's a master plan behind it. Well, the same is true in the church. God has got a plan. He's not just throwing us together. The place where you fit, the way that he's shaping you and designing you, he's got a place where you fit, and it's all part of a master plan. It's a part of a master plan that God is working together. Why? Because in Christ, the people of God gathered in, gathered in the church of God are the temple of God for the glory of God. God's going somewhere with this thing. He has you sitting in a seat, singing in the choir, teaching in a class. He has you as a part of a discipleship class. He has a, has you in a relationship with somebody because he's building something and he has the master plan. Here's the thing about the master plan. It's true with Legos and it's certainly true in our walk with the Lord. You've got to trust that the master plan is headed somewhere because I'll tell you, even as a 39 year old adult, sometimes I'm I'm building something and I think, I bet this piece goes right here, even though they haven't told me in the instruction booklet yet. And and I'll tell you what's a, you can make a big mistake by taking that piece and attaching it and thinking, yeah, I know this one's probably going to go right here. So I'll go ahead and do that. I have learned step one, step two, step three, step four, and everything will come together. Now we all also know they put extra pieces in there. And when you get to the end of it, you have extra pieces. And you know why I think they do that? I think they laugh as they put those extra pieces in that bag. And they say, I'd like to see them figure this out. They just throw extra pieces in there. (laughs) Thankfully, God's master plan isn't work like that. He's got everything worked out. But it takes a lot of trust. It takes a one step at a time kind of approach. God has me where he has me. He's doing with me what he's doing with me. He knows what he's doing. He's putting me in place because we are being built together. You are being built together with me. I am being built together with you. We're being used and we're being built together into something. What is that something? Well, that leads me to the third point. In Christ, we are the temple of God. This is the most beautiful part of this entire passage to me. 
That God says, it's not just any building that I'm building. In fact, the verse that we we read says this, we are being built together into a dwelling place. Well, what kind of dwelling place? We're being built together into a house. We're being built together into this dwelling place. But if we back up just one verse into verse 21, we we read this. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So God is building a temple. What is a temple? A temple is a place on earth that represents God in heaven. It's a place on earth where God can meet, God from heaven can meet with his people and can work out his plan for the nations. We are being built into that very thing. And it's a place on earth that gives glory to the God of heaven. We're being built into that very thing. So this is not some haphazard plan. God has a plan. He knows where I fit. He knows where you fit. He knows when to bring the right pieces in. He's working that plan out. And he is building not just anything. He is building a holy temple unto the Lord in Christ. We are the temple of God. And Paul tells us, earlier in these verses, that the foundation's already been laid. The foundation that's already been laid is that of the apostles and the prophets. That represents God's word. God has spoken. This is his word. It is the foundation upon which we build the church. You know, there are many churches now that are kind of pulling away from that. They're pulling away from that and they're saying, well, you know, there's some things in God's word that are hard to understand. Those are some things in God's word that are hard to apply. So we're just kind of kind of pull away from that. You can't do that. It's the foundation. You pull the foundation out and the building will crumble. So I want to encourage you, just as I encouraged our our students in the the first service, that as you listen to a pastor preach or maybe you visit another church and, and you're thinking, well, maybe this is a good place for me to send my kids going off to college. I'm visiting a church with them and trying to decide what's a... It's a good place for them. You know what you're looking for? You're looking for a church that is built on the apostles and the prophets, a church that is founded on the word of God. So don't be caught up in this trap. You walk into the room and the music's great. By the way, our our music's great. I mean, are we not blessed with talent from the Lord? I told Tommy earlier today, I said, Tommy, you're going to have to find somebody around here that can sing. I mean, my goodness. Uh, But we have a lot of talent. So there's nothing wrong with good music. In fact, good music is great. Good music uh, magnifies a good God who is a God who deserves our best. And so we give him our best. We use the talent we've been given to do our best. So there's nothing wrong with good music. But you walk in and the music's good. The pastor walks out. He looks like he stepped off the cover of GQ. You know what I'm talking about? And and you're like, man, that guy looks sharp. Now, there's nothing wrong with a sharp-looking pastor. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. But here's what you're looking for. You're looking for what happens when it comes time to open God's Word. Sometimes what you'll find is God's Word's not even open. Sometimes you'll find that God's Word is barely referenced as if it's something that is in the way of what He's trying to say. But what you're looking for is a guy who says, look at this verse right here. Look at that word. Look, see how that word is, is worded right there and, and, and see what he was saying before that and, and see where he's going after that. And this is what God is trying to tell us in his word. Someone who is so attached to their Bible that they continually have to come back to it and say, look, now see, remember we were talking about this. Now we're going to talk about that. How did we decide to go from talking about one thing to talking about another thing? Because that's what the Bible does. It talks about this thing and now it's going to talk about that thing. And so that's what we're going to talk about. That's what you're looking for when you look for someone who preaches the word, either in this, in this church or another church. If you're looking in this church and we're not doing that, you need to come to us and say, hey, you're not teaching us the word. And it's the foundation of the apostles and the prophets that uphold the church. If we pull that out, then the, the, the thing will crumble. And then Christ Jesus, he tells us, is the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone is that most important first stone that is laid. It's the stone which the rest of the walls, their weight kind of lays back on that stone. But it's also the stone that sets the direction. It's the stone that tells you which way the walls are going to go. And and that stone is set perfectly in place. It's the most precise stone in the entire building because every other stone is laid based off of that stone. And so it's always placed first. So Paul says, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. We We put him down, and that's how we line all the walls up so that we know everything is exactly how it should be. That's why we like to say that when you want to look at how to live your life out, if you want to look and see if you're following God the way that God intends for us to follow him, we look at Jesus. 
And it's Jesus that he's conforming us. He's conforming our hearts into the image of his son because Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And that's, that's the foundation and the cornerstone that we've been given as a church. But what happens in verse 22 is that we're brought in. In him, you also. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So now we have a part. The foundation is laid. The cornerstone is in place. And now we come in. We are the temple of God. You know, I love this thought that in Solomon's temple, Solomon gave clear instructions that all of the blocks for the temple were to be built and shaped off-site. This is how it's worded in 1 Kings chapter 6. It says this, In building the temple, only blocks dressed at the quarry were used, and no hammer, chisel, or any other iron tool was heard at the temple site while it was being built. In other words, Solomon said, this is a holy place. We're building a holy building here, and I don't want to hear hammers. I don't want to hear chisels. You get it all right at the quarry and bring it up here and put it into place. But when you bring it up here, there's no last-minute fine-tuning. If it's not right, take it back down to the quarry and get it right because I don't want the sound of a hammer or a chisel heard on this site. And so you can just picture them at the quarry, shaping these blocks out, working really hard. Uh, they would need a master plan. They would need to know where every block was going. They would need to know what was coming up next. And they would need to have an entire master plan laid out as they shape these blocks in the quarry. They send them up to the temple site, and they fit precisely the way that they're supposed to be. The level of precision and planning that this requires is almost unimaginable. But what I like about that is the way it reminds us of the work that God's doing in our lives. We sang about it a couple of months ago as, as we got ready for Christmas. We sang that God would fit us for heaven to live with him there. That's what God's doing to us according to the chief cornerstone. He is shaping us. He's molding us into the image of Christ. That's our great promise. Our great promise is that those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the likeness of his son. Our great promise is that, that when you walk through the valley, when you walk on the mountain, when you walk through the good times and the bad times, that God is always at work shaping us into the image of his son Jesus so that we fit exactly into the plan for his eternal glory and our eternal good the way that he intended it to be. There is a master plan. God is working it out. He is shaping us into something, not just anything, but the temple of God. In Christ, the people of God, gathered in the church of God, are the temple of God to the glory of God. These means my last point. In Christ, we bring glory to God. Paul closes that statement and that section out by saying that we are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit's work in our life, but the purpose is not us. It's not that, well, you have a place and you belong and you find your fit and you find your purpose. That's all true. That's all true. In fact, you'll never find your fit anywhere else. God's designed you as a being to connect. And, and when you try to connect to other places, we spend a lot of our lives trying to find our, our place to connect in other places. And as you, you look for that, you're not going to find it anywhere other than the family of God. But ultimately, it's not about us. Ultimately, it's about God and his glory, that we come together, all shapes and sizes, all colors, all backgrounds, and we are built together into a beautiful master plan that God is working out for his glory. In fact, here's the way that this works. God in eternity past says, my glory is so great that it is too great not to share with somebody else. And, and so I'm going to create beings to share my glory with, to bring them into my presence so they can experience the very glory of God so that they'll find their way to me. I'm going to design them so that they will not find fulfillment anywhere else. They won't find it in sex. They won't find it in money. They won't find it in power. They won't find it in fame. They might look for it, but they're not going to find it there. And eventually, they're going to find their fit, bringing glory to me. And then God works in our lives, shapes us into the image of Christ, brings us right into that place where we find our fit, bringing glory to him forever so that we experience the most precious thing in all of existence the glory of God and fellowship 
with God himself. That's where God's bringing this. That's what God's doing. That's what God is working out. God has designed us in that way. And then here's where it gets hard. It gets hard because in light of that, in light of knowing that God is, has got a place to fit us, but we don't know where that place is. Only he does. He's the master planner. He's got the master plan. Here's where it gets hard. It takes trust and surrender. All weekend long, I've been talking to the students about surrender and trust. Just saying, God, it's okay that I don't know what's next. It's okay that I don't know what the next page of the instructions are going to hold. It's okay that I can look at page four and I can do what you've asked me to do on page four before I ever know what's coming on page five. It is trust and it's surrender. See, we want, we want God to say, here's the whole plan. Let me just show you how it's all going to work. Uh, I'll, make a, I'll make a deal with you. If you'll trust me here and you'll follow me there and you'll break off that relationship you know you shouldn't be in or you'll walk away from that job that you know you shouldn't be in or if you'll begin to, to really dive in and serve at church or serve in the way that I'm really nudging you to serve, then, then here's what will happen. You know, a couple years down the road, you're going to be driving a Ferrari down the interstate. Just It's going to be fantastic. And, you know, everything's going to work out. You're going to get that job you wanted. And, and by the time you retire, you're going to own four or five homes and you're going to travel the world skiing and at the beach. That's how it's all going to work out. Just trust me. That's, you're on page four, but let me show you page 30. And we go, okay, God, I like that, but uh, could we change the Ferrari out for a Porsche? I've always been more of a Porsche kind of guy. And God says, okay, that's good. Ferrari out, Porsche in. Okay, good. Do we have a deal? Are you ready to surrender? That's, that's how we want God to do it. But it is not what he does. God says, you do not come to me on your terms. You come to me on my terms. And what are my terms? My terms are complete and total surrender. Yeah, but God, what, what's going to happen? Surrender. Lord, what's your plan? Surrender. Lord, what's going to happen to, to me if I do take this step? Surrender. Trust. Faith. Knowing that what God has promised us is that he will shape us into the image of his son. He has a plan for us, and that plan is for his eternal glory and our eternal good. That's what God has said, and that's all God will say. And God will show us one step at a time as we trust him and we follow him and we see the plan unfold. And sometimes we don't know how it all fits together. Sometimes we find ourselves in the middle of the the process and we think, Lord, I don't know how this is all going to work out. God says, you know what? Trust me. Surrender to me. Give it up. Do things my way. I have a plan. That brings me to what I'm asking you to do today very simple. You will only find your fit in the family of God. And you'll only find it by complete, total surrender to Him. I challenged our students to pray this, and I'm going to challenge you to pray it. God, I surrender. I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll say anything you want me to say to anybody you want me to say it to. Wow. Pastor, that is a tough prayer to pray. You know what that is? It's a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer of complete and total trust and surrender to the Lord. Just letting go. God, you're in charge. I'm not. Lord, you know I don't. Lord, you're the boss. I am not. I surrender to you. I'll do anything you want me to do. Go anywhere you want me to go. Say anything you want me to say to anybody you want me to say it to. Would you bow your heads?